Testing one, two, three. It's one o'clock, and thank you everybody for attending the tax exempt review committee. Uh, we all have four items on our agenda. Agenda item number one is to approve tax exempt review committee minute meetings of 7 23 2019. Uh, if you've had a chance to review those ahead of time, uh, we would, uh, if there's any changes or corrections, otherwise, we'll accept a motion. Move to approve. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Number two, a new industry application by Computer Technology in Innovations doing business as Vox Telesis. Does that sound correct? And so, uh, and maybe Ben, I don't know who, who's going to start, but, uh, or, or Jim. I think we'll have uh, John Mahachik from the uh, EDC introduce the uh, company and the project. Very good. So that's great. If you don't mind giving us your name and your organization, that'd be great, and you'll get us started. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, so John Mahachik with the Greater Fargo Moorhead EDC. Um, I've been. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce these guys. I've been working with them for about a month or so now, and um, helped them with their primary sector certification. I uh, got that approved. Um, started business with them, realizing pretty much all their businesses in the software they're doing is outside of the state. And um, this has just been one of those kind of really nice projects that um, things just kind of, a lot of the programs are working out well for them. And this is a, a prime example of them, to, you know, as they're a growing company, they're out of space where they're at. And um, and I, and I don't, might be stealing some of their thunder a little bit, but uh, as they're talking and they had the, the ownership or the location in Nebraska, and as they're thinking about where to grow, um, it made a lot of sense when they started looking at the programs we had here and they said the business friendly environment. In fact, they just said it was a, a wise move when they decided to expand in Fargo versus Nebraska. And I said a smart move would be better because that's a branding we have at the EDC. So it was a smart move. Um, but just kind of the gratitude and how well they're working with the programs and um, how programs like this and some other ones are actually are, are really uh, key factors in, in allowing them to grow. So I really won't get any more further than that. Um, I just, it's just it's been a pleasure. So uh, I'm looking forward to having them um, present this to you. So I, I refer to the CTI, but uh, uh, Vox Telus, as you can come on up. And obviously, if you have any questions for me later, feel free to ask. That's great. And if you gentlemen would give us your name, and, and I hope I pronounced the, the last part of your business correctly. If not, I apologize for that. Go ahead. My name is Bruce Burke. I'm Michael Jennings. Great. And so, and if you want to give us a short description, and then if you don't mind, we'll maybe ask a few questions. And then, Ben, maybe you can uh, help us along with that, too. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I'll just let you know that we're a technology software development company. Uh, we started, the company started in Nebraska in early 2000, and we were developed, we started to uh, it was organized to uh, do appointment reminders in the medical field, and we have since grown that business and made the decision uh, in 2015 that we wanted to, to move our headquarters, our corporation, all, every, all the branding and everything to, to North Dakota. Uh, we selected Fargo as a location, and primarily because of NDSU, because of the graduates um, of software developers, and so it's proven to be a good choice with us. Uh, we've uh, partnered with, uh, with NDSU and the North Dakota Center of Excellence. We're on a research development project with them right now, and we've basically just grown out of our space. We're, we're in a thousand square feet right now, and uh, our, we're, well, we're, we're full beyond our means right now. We can't support anymore. We'd like to add a couple more interns, but we don't have space for them. And so, so this is an opportunity to purchase a building that will give us the space to grow. Um, our projections for next year, uh, we're planning to double our employee employees from uh, 11 employees to 19. And so the additional space will give us the room to grow or to, um, to support the staff that we have and to, um, you know, to, to be in that building for a long time without having to worry about a move again. So that's what we're looking for. 
This is that's the opportunity that we're um, what we need this building for. So, great. And so, Ben, are there some key numbers? And if anybody on the panel has any questions, uh, but but as far as the number of employees and things like that, you want to point out to us? Sure. Just a couple things. One, they are a primary sector. Um, company which is required for the five-year exemption by statute and we through our calculator that's on page 10 um, with the number of jobs and so forth they do reach the 100 point level they're at 101.5 to make it uh, eligible for a recommended approval I guess the number that jumps out at me is the especially the wages obviously that's what are the tax exempt review committee we're trying to promote new jobs especially high wage jobs and to me a couple of these numbers five over thirty five dollars an hour that's very impressive obviously that's you know engineering or, or that type of level of, of staff but I think obviously that's those are great jobs to be bringing to our town for sure mr. mayor I suppose you're excited to get to a, next to a football team that's national champions as well eh? <laughs> We well, you know all about the Bison. I've lived in North Dakota all my life, so <laughs> Bison fans. Hey, congratulations. I think it's a great addition, and your point valuation is 101. And uh, if we get anyone close to 100, that's fantastic. So you broke the mark of 100, so that uh, would be a project that we very strongly would support. So can I just ask you, so the number of employees uh, in year 119, and then obviously year 5 is 40, so with – is that you're obviously going to have a bigger facility than you need at this time and then you're hoping to grow into it is that kind of your vision we have another location in nebraska and we we plan to grow that location as well and so not with engineering staff as much as accounting and and so um part of that growth that you're seeing won't all be in north dakota okay. about a third of it will be in in nebraska very good. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll accept a motion. I move to approve a five-year exemption. And do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you for your time. You Thank bet. You so much. And thank you for the EDC, too, as well, for uh, obviously helping them th through getting through all the hoops. That's uh, part of the challenge, so we appreciate your support. Okay, <clears throat> number three, a pilot application by City Flats, LLC, for a low-income housing project. Uh, Jim. Um, I'll introduce this. I'll ask uh, Aaron Anderson um, from the uh, development uh, company uh, uh, to join me up here. Um, this is a request for a payment in lieu of taxes for low-income housing uh, project. Our current policy is to provide up to a 90%, actually up to 100% exemption. Uh, they have not asked for that full amount. They've uh, figured into their uh, payment that they pay. Um, I think it works out to about, um, I think they'd be paying about 22% uh, of what the taxes would normally be. Uh, the reason for that is that this building will have restricted rents, and so the income stream will be less than a, a typical apartment building. Yet when the assessment department goes out and values the building, uh, they really aren't able to take into account that restricted uh, rent in determining the value. They're going to look at the value uh, compared to other buildings. So there's, there's two main reasons why uh, this exemption is needed to, um, uh, to make the project feasible. Uh, first of all, if they didn't have the exemption, they'd be paying $82,000 a year in property taxes. With this exemption, however, they'll pay about $18,000. So uh, they'll still be contributing to um, you know, costs of uh, city, county, and, and school services, but at a lower rent or at a lower rate because of the, the rents. Uh, secondly, they're applying for a low income housing tax credits, and these are extremely competitive. And part of one of the scoring criteria is, is there local financial support for the project? Um, last year, this project uh, had applied. It came close to getting approved. Uh, they've been encouraged to apply again. And so um, it was kind of key last year to them getting close. 
Uh, unfortunately, last year, Cass County neglected or uh, did not participate in it. Uh, we did think that hurt their score and may have been one of the factors uh, that caused them to not uh, get the money to make it feasible. So, uh, it, you know, if they don't get the local support, they're probably not going to get the state money that's crucial. And if they don't get the property taxes uh, lowered, uh, the, it really isn't feasible to operate the project and proceed anyway. So those are the two main reasons. I'll ask uh, Aaron to um, kind of address uh, how many apartments will be and um, uh, what we're trying, uh, what the need is in our community. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for your time. My name is Erin Anderson. I'm with Commonwealth Development Corporation. Um, many of you, I believe, were here last year when I presented this project. Um, this is a second phase to what is now the Edge Artist Flats, um, which has been open for a month now. We're in our first month of occupancy. Um, we've seen really strong interest in the development and lease up is going going well um, and we've had the the vision for a second phase really since the beginning of working on that site um, when we designed the first phase we made sure there was room for a second phase um, basically a mirror image if you will of the first phase and this is affordable housing for low and moderate income folks ranging from 30 percent of the county median income up to 80 percent um, that is a slight difference from the original phase which went up to 60 percent area median income so this will actually also pick up a, a, a little additional piece of the market um, that is not otherwise served one thing that we did change from our application last year which as jim mentioned was um, not successful in in obtaining tax credits last year. Unfortunately, we were two points shy. So we were the first cut, um, very close. And so we've been encouraged to reapply. Um, and we did make some changes to the unit mix. We have more three bedrooms, um, fewer two bedrooms this, this time. We have uh, reduced the rent on the 80% county median income units because of response from our property management team during the lease up. We do have the advantage of having the active lease up where we can get real time feedback as to what people are looking for. Um, and so with that, that's put even more financial burden on this development and an even greater need for the property tax reduction. Um, we reduced the unit count from 48 units down to 42 units. Um, again, that's related to financial feasibility and really the limitations of the amount of funding that's available uh, per project per year. Um, so what we have currently is 15 one bedroom units, 13 two bedroom and 14 three bedroom units. Um, and the rents range from, for example, on a two bedroom unit, um, $463 up to, um, on a three bedroom, 80% unit, $1,000 at the high end, including utilities. Um, so there's really a wide range. It's, it's intended to be for mixed incomes. Rain, um, so there's a, a grady, grady, graduated scale of different opportunities for, for folks depending on what their situation is. The property tax incentive is critical here because with the property taxes as they're originally um, at the market rate, the project would be completely upside down. It wouldn't even be able to support a first mortgage at all with the, with the income <laughs> that the project can support. Um, and, and it's absolutely crucial that, that those taxes are brought down to a level that the project can support at these rent levels, otherwise it's not feasible. Um, you know, I think, I think we've, Commonwealth has been able to prove that we do what we set out to do um, in finishing our first phase successfully. I think it turned out to be a quality 
project, and if you haven't had the opportunity to visit it yet, um, I definitely uh, recommend taking a couple minutes to maybe take a tour or even just drive by the property if you don't have to go time to go through it. But we're really excited about really completing this second phase that's been part of the vision from the beginning. Um, we know North Dakota Housing Finance Agency has commented to us that this is a critical piece, that um, even the county portion in, is important um, and necessary for financial feasibility. Um, the other thing that we also encountered in, in real time as we constructed the first phase is we knew there were soil issues. Um, they did end up being even worse <laughs> than we anticipated, which seems to happen at time to time. Um, there's a number of site conditions on the site that otherwise would not make it attractive to a, a lot of other developers. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really a brownfield site. It, it has known contamination and, uh, and bad soils. And, you know, and so the cost is elevated um, due to that nature. Um, so all of these things add up to really the necessity for your support in this. And I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Does anybody have any questions? I guess, Aaron, the, the question I have is, so then would you say this gives you more flexibility? Because the original one, there was people that started out almost at the homeless level. And so now they can kind of basically move through actually that whole, is it, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily see them moving from one building to the other. However, it does, open up a, a slightly wider market. There is still, um, I'm glad you brought up the permanent supportive housing because there is still the component of permanent supportive housing it, with the second phase as well, a small portion. Um, we have nine units uh, dedicated for permanent supportive housing and we're still working with Senca to, um, as we get through the first phase to really identify the, the primary need there, whether that be for dis disabilities or homeless. Um, but that piece is equally critical to meeting the state's mission to further affordable housing without including a small portion of permanent supportive housing. There's no way that this project will get funded. Um, last year, most of the developments funded were 100% supportive housing. Uh, many of them for senior housing, though. Um, and so the there are a certain number of units. We have 40, about 40% 40 of the units, in fact, that would be at that 80% income level, whereas the first phase was up to 60%. So there's, there's definitely a, a slightly larger market here, but the rent's still being at that affordable level. The other thing I just want to add real quick, this is a discussion that we had last night at the city commission meeting, how the importance of having different types of housing in the downtown footprint, and that's what this is. And so it's it's a great thing. And I guess I may have a question for Jim. You, maybe you can help us. But to me, this is ridiculous that the Cass County Commission didn't approve this. So is, is there something we can do if we vote uh, in favor of this to to put pressure on them to say, uh, this is what we need. So do you have any advice? Is, can we send a letter of recommendation? Should we go to the meeting? So maybe it might not be a good idea if I went to the meeting because I would be a little more <laughs> confrontational. Because, I, I mean, to vote against uh, tax credits for low-income housing is, uh, that's stunning to me. So do you have any advice on what we should do? Um, I think maybe just, you know, the but for test uh, on this, the um, we haven't sent this to the financial advisor. Um, usually with the nonprofits, we've offered um, to do that at no cost. However, I knew, do know that the North Dakota Housing Finance Agency looks closely at the financials and, and wouldn't award them um, any more than they'd, they need. And so I think it'd be kind of duplicative for us to, to send it to our financial advisor. However, if you're interested in, uh, we could do that. Um, probably just stress that um, the, uh, you know, this is just, it's a 15 year exemption, which is the same as the affordability period. So after 15 years, the affordability period can change and, and the exemption would, would end at that point to point that out. Um, you know, last year I was maybe particularly disappointed because the county um, supported two uh, 
two exemptions for low-income housing in West Fargo um, at a 20-year level, and they didn't approve this one at a 15-year level. So I don't know if we can uh, point that out and kind of ask for equal treatment between West Fargo and Fargo this year. Mr. Mayor. I think what happened on that, and Robert might confirm it, but the first one they didn't fully understand. I think they kind of understand the low-income style. It might be a different story now because I think initially the first one was when you guys were having some discussion, public discussion about taxes, and I don't think your commission was ready for a 15 or 20 year exemption at that time. Uh, would it be fair to say, Robert, they might look at this a little bit differently now that we know kind of what's going on here, and this is really critical for this project? The, the comment that I would make uh, is that when they were considering the Artist Flats project uh, a year ago, I, I heard a very clear message coming back from the commission that they did not feel they had the uh, had sufficient information to to make that decision at that time. I've uh, uh, review, had a chance to review the information that's provided on this uh, application. I have some additional specific feedback from a, a commissioner who has maybe been most vocal in, in some of the questions. So I, I believe I have, uh, will have an opportunity to provide some more specific questions back that might elicit a little more information uh, on this time, uh, this application. So I think there, there were, uh, they felt that they had some very well um, grounded concerns and reasons for making the decisions they made last time. I think we can address some of the concerns as far as providing information, but um, again, as these come before, uh, uh, before the body, uh, based on state statute as it is, they, these have the ability to be reviewed by uh, uh, three different entities and, and they, uh, our commission f simply feels like they're doing their due diligence in each of uh, these projects and doing their review. So the thing that's stunning to me is this is low income housing. I, I just, uh, I can't believe it. And so, so I, I, I hope that the voters are paying attention to this because for whatever reason, uh, our Cass County Commission seems to be uh, making decisions that are just uh, inexcusable. It's low income housing. <laughs> and they're, and they're uh, being, it's, it's, to me it's embarrassing. And I, I, I gotta be honest, I, I hope the voters make some changes in the future because that's unacceptable to me. That, this is what we're talking about. We need to have low income housing in, in the city of Fargo. That's what we need to do, period. And so it's, it's just, uh, anyway, I better stop before I go too far. Erin, will you so save me? I just wanted to say I definitely would appreciate to obtain those questions as soon as possible so that I can respond to them. I, um, I think that would be very helpful going into that meeting as much as I can prepare for those questions and provide response even in advance. Um, I think, you know, if there's misunderstandings, uh, I'd like to really head those up right away. Um, you know, and, and we're average rent of $600 a unit. So it's just not in the same ballpark as any market rate property. And that's really what I need to drive home. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yep. Um, so we obviously don't know what's going to happen this year um, with the low income housing tax credits, but presume for the sake of argument that maybe because of some action at the county level or not, but that this doesn't get approved. What happens with this property going forward? Is there a point in time where you sort of abandon this idea of low income and it becomes another purpose? Perhaps. Um, we're, we're under contract with the Kilburn Group t for the purchase of the land. Um, so ultimately, what happens to this property is up to them because they own the land. Um, if we're not successful, they would be able to decide whether they want to work with us another go around or if they'd rather move on and do something else with this this piece of property um and that very well could happen after the second time or or they may say they want to try again i i really don't know mayor when hud was here last week we had that discussion about tax exempt different things that the state's doing and 
the robustness of that is not a lot. So West Fargo did get two projects, but there's not a lot of help we oftentimes get from the state just because there's not a big breadth of money that's available. You missed it by two points last time. I would hope with the county they would understand that's so the reason I'm excited about this project is three bedroom. It's very hard to find three bedroom apartments for people with low income and oftentimes they have big families. So it's important to have that open. So I would hope Robert would give you the questions that they have and perhaps you'll be more successful. But I, I think with uh, what Jim says, they did give West Fargo two exemptions and maybe it'd be better better suited this time. So Dave, I think it's worth an effort to try to get them to come about. The thing that bothered me even more was they gave West Fargo more generous exemptions than us, which is <laughs> stunning. And so like I said, I, I think it would be best if I quit talking. Otherwise, I would say something I might regret. But but obviously, this is a great pro, a, a great project. And uh, go ahead, Jim. Do you have something to add? Yeah, just wanted to give you the uh, kind of the magnitude of the property taxes. If they uh, you know don't get this exemption, basically the property taxes per month per unit would be one hundred and sixty two dollars. And so, when we're trying to have your rents be lower, when you add one hundred and sixty-two dollars um, in property taxes for per apartment. You know that gets to be real hard to, uh, to make that work. Uh, the other factor here is that uh, you know these are for some families, so there'll be some school kids, and uh, they'd be feeding into the North Side schools. And so we do have a certainly capacity in our our North Side elementary and secondary schools uh, for more students. So uh, that's no real burden to the uh, property taxpayers to. Uh, to bring more kids into those neighborhoods. All right, I have one more to add, and then I, I might get myself in hot water, but I would encourage the Cass County Commission to maybe focus on all the other towns in Cass County. We have a whole building full of professionals for economic development and all that stuff. That's what we do. So there's lots of towns in our county that don't have that, that maybe they could give them advice on and maybe mind th th that business a little closer and uh, let the professionals be in charge of Fargo. How about that? That's a little hot water, Mr. Mayor. All right, with that, do we have a motion? I have one question. So can, depending on what the questions are from the county that you're getting, those might be questions they're gonna need answered every single time there's the similar project. And depending on what they are, Ben, can we add them as um, as needed to try to get ahead of any concerns that they have when we're looking at it, um, it wouldn't, wouldn't be applicable for the overall application, obviously. But if there's going to be a continual need to explain something in a certain area that we give you an, or applicants enough time, this was submitted on the 20th, and I'm sure it was worked on well before that. But um, over the course of the last year, that they've been work, the county's been working through their concerns. They've probably come up with a whole number of questions that uh, they need answered and should be able to give you enough time to research, do your due diligence, and come up with an answer that's comprehensive and not under a crunch time. So if we could look at that as well, that would, yeah, I think that would be, be appreciated. a huge benefit. Mr. Chairman, um, I'd move to approve the property tax exemption for City Flats LL with yep. a request to the County Commission to reconsider their previous denial. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Number four, presentation Thank by you. the Fargo Moorhead Economic Development Corporation, uh, new expanding business economic impact analysis. Uh, Dave, I, I invited uh, Joe Rezo to, to speak on this. He had provided this information on the impact of Aldebaran, and, and I think in some ways this can be translated to every primary sector business. And I. I think it's just good information for you to have to, to be aware of the other positive impact of these primary sector businesses in Fargo. So uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, committee, for the opportunity to um, have a conversation on um, a topic that we as the EDC representing uh, Fargo in the region uh, want to do our due diligence uh, that as we are bringing forward uh, primary sector company projects uh, to you uh, and to the other communities in the counties uh, that we can provide you uh, a little bit more of an insight into what the impact um, could be uh, on those projects to our regional economy and in some cases specifically to industry sectors 
what Sammy Rowe uh, just handed out to all of you is a uh, front and back of a one pager um, that is specific really to the private sector, uh, not to the public sector return. And the reason I wanted to provide that to all of you is that uh, as we work with primary sector companies, again, I'll briefly define that for you and, and the public. If you think about our regional economy, there are roughly 13, 14,000 businesses uh, here. And of those, somewhere in the tune of three to 5%, let's just say 500, uh, wake up every day worried about selling their products and services nationally and globally. Uh, much of their uh, revenue is not generated within our regional economy. And because of that, uh, many of them can make the decision at times to want to make an investment in other places and still serve their clientele. Um, Aldevron's a great example of that recent project. They have operations in Madison, Wisconsin, in Germany, and as many of you know, have uh, just received um, some significant VC funding. Uh, and when other decision makers come uh, into the fold, uh, we believe strongly that we want to present um, an understanding of what it means to keep a primary sector business here uh, and uh, help them to grow, attract new ones to the area, and uh, build new ones uh, from the beginning. And so uh, there are impacts um, that are felt uh, to the tax base of, of every taxing body, whether that's a park district or a city or a county or a school district. Um, but there are also impacts uh, that are felt uh, to the other local businesses um, that kind of churn the money uh, within the economy. And the sheet of paper that we handed out gives you a sense of, on one side, there's numbers for 2014 to 2018. Uh, these are numbers that um, were created uh, economic impact numbers that uh, were uh, provided to us um, by an applied economist at uh, NDSU. Uh, we don't run these analysis ourselves. Uh, he uses an economic modeling uh, software called Implan. This is used across the nation um, by various organizations to help their local decision makers understand impact. So if you look at the 2014 to 2018 numbers, you can see some industries, uh, construction for example, uh, where you're looking at well over $100 million of impact to that industry, real estate, uh, $176 million, and right on down the line. Uh, so the decisions that you're making uh, at this level and at the commission level uh, not only have an impact on the tax dollars or sales taxes that come in as revenue to support uh, city operations, um, but they have uh, various indirect or what we call induced impacts on so many other sectors. Uh, what I say to a lot of people is without primary sector, you have no economy. And so it's really important to understand that as these companies are making decisions, uh, they can make those to locate and grow anywhere. Uh, we just saw an example of that um, with um, uh, the last company that came in front of us uh, that you're supporting, and we really appreciate that. So I wanted to kind of give that introduction. Uh, Jim thought it might be important for you to, and the, and the public to understand um, at a macro level and even down to a certain industry level uh, what the decisions you're making for primary sector companies are doing for the entire economy and why you invest in, and so many others invest in us, the county and hundreds of private investors to continue to see this growth. Take any questions or comments that you might have on this information. Any questions? I'll start out if that's okay. So can you kind of, so I'm looking at the first page with the 2014 through 2018. Yeah. So then it has a, has a broken down. So there's numbers for like, let's start at the top accommodations. So then yeah. that's the amount of revenue that came in over those because of the primary sector jobs that were created. At, at a bare minimum. So for example, in that time frame, we helped assist 125 projects. Um, but in some cases there weren't um, solid numbers, let's say, given on employment or on um, uh, new space investments. Uh, so when we did the analysis, we asked uh, our applied economists to zero those out. So what you're seeing are very conservative figures as to what that impact would be. Um, that next one down, you can see administrative and support services over 47 million. Uh, so think about if these companies did not make the decision to hire people to invest, to add square footage, this, would, this is what would come out of the market, wouldn't even exist at a bare minimum, a very conservative number uh, for that sector of our economy. That's awesome. 
Any other any other questions, Mayor? On page 22, we had something in our booklet as well that talked about Aldevron, and I guess, Joe, what I'd really like from you sometime, um, if we can match, there's exempt tax property, but there's, you talk about an increase in tax revenue of 247,000. You talk about the employees buying homes, doing different things, and I know it's hard to do sometime, but if you have 130 or 105 jobs, you gotta live somewhere or be in an apartment or be in a house or be somewhere, um, we always get caught up in just exactly what the tax exemption is, but I don't think yeah. we get caught up in what the impact is. So Aldevron uh, is going to triple its space now, hire more people. Uh, they have an impact in our community, and they have sales tax. They do pay property tax. They do do different things. I don't think we put that in the formula so the public knows that, because if I have... 100 families that are buying homes that's 100 homes that's that's going to pay tax on and right. and uh, they're going to do a variety of things in their spending habits so we have good shopping um it's interesting to me going to fergus falls every now and then they say we don't have a place to buy clothes we have to go to fargo i mean a lot of the rural sites have lost a lot of their shopping capabilities but i mean we are a destination center for the community a lot of that money stays in the community. But it would be nice, Jim, if we could do something that matches. Okay, you're giving up some taxes, but what's coming in with the new projects? And I know, John, when you originally started on tax exempt years ago, you guys just kept looking at jobs, how many jobs. And we know not every business brings in jobs anymore because it's uh, automated or there's some, uh, DigiD is a good example. But yet there's other impacts they have on our economy that I think people sometimes forget. And Dave was talking about it last night at the commission meeting. There's impacts that you have to look at in the community. And if you have growth, and I think, John, you'd also say that when you were a commissioner to now, Fargo has had on parallel, it has great growth. It really makes it a lot easier for many decisions to be made because we do have that growth. But, Joe, I'm just wondering if we could have something like that. Just sometimes the public gets lost in the trees here, what, what's yeah. actually going on. If you have a, a, a community that's losing population, you've got a much big struggle. And I was laughing because I was at a meeting in uh, New York City talking to the Buffalo of New York City mayor, and they've lost population, almost 50% of their population. And I said, what, I mean, what makes it so tough in Buffalo? And, and he's talking to me from Fargo, and he said, it's the weather, Jim, it's the weather. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm not going to get into this, how I'm able to recruit. But uh, if you think weather is bad in Buffalo, then I have to say that uh, Fargo has got its challenges too, but we're growing. And he said to me, he says, that's what we're hearing, Tim, is we you know Fargo is a, is a nationally people recognize for whatever reason we're growing as a community. So he complimented us, but I always chuckled a little bit when he said, oh, it's the weather. Well, I'd, I'd say a couple things to that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one is I, I think it's just as important to look at these types of analysis around, yes, the value of the growth, but also the importance of the stability of retaining and continuing to see the employment. So if Aldevron's at 300 employees growing to 1,000, the reality is every year that they still have 300 employees that they're making payroll and those dollars are circulating through the economy into these different sectors is, is providing that stability um, that sometimes we miss. We, we don't think about it. If we're not seeing growth, we, we maybe don't think we're doing that well, and obviously we are, um, but stability is really important to maintain basic services, as, as you all know. Um, and, and, then, and then secondly, um, when you're challenged with the question of a tax exemption, and I think this is the point you were making, is there are other impacts that that particular company is making on the economy. And the example uh, with Aldevron that we were talking about, if you add up, let's say, the payroll impact, the sales tax, the, the general taxes in other areas, the new construction, not just on their facility, but other construction that will happen because of that, if you look at that cumulatively over a five-year period, this one project's benefiting this regional economy by about a half a billion dollars. That's a B, B a billion with a B. And, and so um, as we continue to support um, these primary sector companies, every decision they're making to, to maintain and be stable or add is really supporting this regional economy. And, um, uh, I've been fortunate enough to work in three different states in a number of markets over two and a half decades, and I will say that what's happening here 
um, is, is very impressive uh, in terms of the economic activity. Our organization alone in the first seven months has supported uh, 22 different projects. Uh, one you just saw come up to the dais here just a few minutes ago. So um, uh, we shouldn't take that for granted. Uh, we should take the opportunities when they come and, and help build a stronger market that will uh, create even more interest on the part of, of uh, those not only here but outside of our region looking at our, our regional economy. Joe, can I ask, like how much is organic and how much is outside recruiting businesses? Like how much is growth, economic yeah. growth in our counties I, or, or again? I think, at, at, let's talk a macro first, uh, across most regional economies. Um, let's say seven of every 10 of your projects that will have companies adding jobs, making investments, are going to be here. They're already going to be in the marketplace. They understand the assets that are here. Um, they have sunk cost in a little in a little ways that they want to play off of um, but the remaining 30 percent is going to be either attraction or new company development some years it might be 2010 the other years it might be 10 20. Um, and that's why it's important for an organization like the edc to stay focused on all three of those obviously the most important is our existing four or five hundred established primary sector companies and that's why we've um, made a concerted effort and have for years, but especially in the last year or so, to really get out there and have strategic conversations because usually one of three things happens. They raise an issue. Um, the lights out in front of my place are turning too quickly. My employees can't get in and out. Can you work with the city and somebody to address that? They also have project issues um, that are specific like in Aldevron, or they have um, a joint list of public policy, either things that are doing well that you, they want to see continued or things that need to be addressed at a local, state, or federal level. And we're kind of the, the point of the spear of that conversation. And we'll be working with Jim and, and the team uh, here in Fargo to continue to do that in a, in a very systematic way. Can I ask one more? So is the retention rate better with the organic, with the local, or, or is it about the same? You know, as far no, as you, you, you take care of your own over time, the retention of that is is, is much higher um, than just having an attraction strategy. Um, it that but, that's usually the case in every market. No, but I, I'm sure you get what I'm saying. But like the the outside companies yeah. that you recruit, let's say it's 70, 30, you know, of the 30 percent is the retention, you know, that they stay here. Is it, is it about the same or is it less or more than the, than the organic companies? If, if what you're asking is if we, were, if we attract, let's say, 10 companies in the next five years, what's the probability that those 10 companies will be here 10 years from now versus the existing companies? Right. It's, much, it's going to be higher that those existing companies will be here. It, no, that's... I was the, only, the only caveat to that is if we're very strategic in the companies we want to attract, and we're not just out there shooting at everything, so to speak. Um, we need to be a market that needs to understand where our assets really lie to be able to sell, so to, you know, to, to track the right companies here. It's UAS, it's ag tech, it's areas where we have strength already that would lead to a higher probability of those companies coming and staying over time. Awesome. John, do you have a question? <clears throat> well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I've been at this tax exemption a long time. Some of you might know I'm sort of fiscally conservative, uh, but uh, it, it's always helped me to understand tax exemption not from what we give up, but what we're investing in. And uh, what Joe's talking about is we need to be good partners. We need to be good partners with our existing businesses and with new businesses. And a small part of that is the tax exemption that we can offer as a form of investment into that business. These, these projects, and, and everybody thinks, you know, you do a big project and day one you're profitable. Uh, they're a struggle. They take a while to turn around and we need to look at this, not, not what we're gonna lose, what we're not gonna get, but to look at it, what we're building towards. And just the success in downtown Fargo. Uh, when I was on the commission in the mid 90s, uh, nobody wanted to be downtown. Nobody wanted to walk downtown. Uh, I happened to work there, so <laughs> I, I was used to it. But uh, Jim, what, what's the, the change from the Renaissance Zone values from the beginning to the end? 
Yeah, the the downtown value we've seen from go from 200 million to over 600 million, and so you know the local taxing jurisdictions are collecting four million dollars more than if the property value hadn't changed. And and John, I think as you recall, you know 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, the businesses or property owners downtown claimed that their property was overvalued. Uh, I don't think we've heard that complaint in a long, long time. <laughs> Absolutely. So I just, uh, I'm happy to be back on this committee, but uh, again, uh, I want to approach it from how do we invest alongside our businesses and how do we become good partners? And that's going to make the job that you have, Joe, much, much easier. And that's going to make this an even better community. Yeah, and I very much appreciate it. And, and the interesting thing as you were talking, I was thinking the value of this conversation might be more valuable over time because as consultants and companies look at this region, they will do Google searches and they'll want to understand and find out, well, how does the leadership approach that relationship? And so hearing what we're all talking about does make our job a little bit easier because they know they're gonna come in with a partnership philosophy um, and, and looking at this as an ROI over time. Um, and I know from, from my seat at the table, when we're talking to primary sector companies and preparing to come forward to you for a conversation, um, as, as much as possible, we wanna come with the data <laughs> and, and show you the ROI um, that these types of projects mean to the community um, because otherwise it, it doesn't lead for a long-term strong relationship if we don't do that. Thank you very much. And John, thank you for joining our group. I appreciate it. You're way smarter than I am. That's not saying much, but I, I really appreciate your experience. You were here in the past, but also you're a very shrewd uh, money guy, and that's what I like because I'm not too bright. And so that helps balance it out. If you have somebody not that bright and a real bright guy, then on average, we're pretty good. So thank you. I have one quick thing. Um, sure. I'd applaud you for coming together with a tool, like a software-based tool modeling system to show the ripple effect because I have people ask me, you know, why are you doing these tax incentives? And it's hard to show them the ripple effect of the larger, you know, ecosystem that you're trying to create as being one small fraction of it, one small piece. And so the more we can bring forward the numbers and knowing that you have the granular detail behind it to support it, and we can model that and continue to provide these long-term, I think people have a really hard time looking at the 100,000 foot view and seeing how something is actually moving and shifting and changing for the better because it's easier to look at an isolated siloed effect. So thank you for bringing it and I'm hoping that we can revisit it on an ongoing basis um, with the same modeling tool over time to get some trending um, so that we can provide a larger conversation about how tax incentive and doing the right thing now will benefit and create that larger ripple effect that we need. Absolutely, and I, I would say that please know that when we come to you with these for these discussions that we come from a position of taking a conservative approach to this and not you know, over promising with with any any project. And ultimately, we're here to support those primary sector companies. Um, but our conversations are, let, let's look at this at, at a conservative basis to make that decision, um, not something that might be hard for us to achieve and cause more problems long term. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. And, you know, I think going on that is Matrix just came off their tax exemption and they bought the land for like 600000 and now that it's come back on the tax rolls, it's worth $239 million. So that's about $2 million in taxable value, or taxes that are now being paid. So when you look at that, it's like, holy cow, plus we got the zoo in that area. So it's one of those things that was truly a win. And if you look at how this works, that our investment has paid off, I think, to John's point is if you hadn't done that, it could have been a field down, nothing much going on, but it's all filled in very nicely. And I think that's one of the, the real home runs that we have hit, and I don't always get the public to understand that. But when I go back and review our properties values as they started in tax exempt, uh, 10 million, and those taxable values are now worth 330 million. So 30 to one return on investment, I think this group's done a great job. Very good, Mark. Um, the one comment that I do have with the analysis piece and understand that, you know, this is an actual, like, complex economic modeler, um, but it may be helpful 
in some very short descriptive language, I'm in layman's terms, to really provide some, I don't know, um, analysis or some understanding of the analysis that goes into this, like the 130 indirect and induced jobs compared to the direct, so that people understand that there is actually some science behind it versus, well, somebody just said, I think it's, you know, <laughs> the multiplier is 1.3. And so, uh, I think just, again, if you're having that conversation with someone, if we took this information now and went out and had that conversation with someone, it's not going to take too long for us as sort of laymen to be out of our element again. Well, where'd the 130 come from? Well, from this black box. Okay. So what's the, what's sort of the science behind it? Without getting, you know, a textbook definition, but like what's the one paragraph elevator speech explanation for, you know, how this modeler actually works, what it's based on. And um, I think that can help to substantiate those conversations so that it's based on sort of more science and fact than it is a, a work of fiction in a sense. And we can certainly work with uh, Dean, uh, who we work with at NDSU. Um, we're always challenging our own assumptions going into this and, and uh, Sammy and I and Dean dug into the, the details behind and the numbers and actually, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson knows from conversations we've had with him at the county, looking kind of deeply into those numbers. But yeah, I, I think at some point in time, that it's one of those where people have a, a general interest, and then when they want a more specific, we we set up a time and <laughs> and 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 dive in if needed. But uh, definitely uh, hear your point, and we'll work to articulate some of those better. Very good. That's it for today. Anything else to add from anyone? <coughs> 152. Thank everybody for being here and have a good afternoon. We are adjourned. <laughs>